Hello, happy Sabbath, church. Are there any visitors with us today? If so, could you please stand? Thank you, thank you. Welcome to our church family. We're glad that you could come. We're honored to share this day with you as we worship God's risen son. We hope that God will touch your life as we worship side by side and that as you leave this place today, God's peace will be inside. We ask that each of you will please stand and greet each other with a wonderful, welcoming Beltsville. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. While you're returning to your seats, we have just a couple of announcements that we want to draw your attention to. Uh, one of them has a slide that we can put up on the screen. While we're getting that, I want to call your attention to these. Yeah, we prepare every year uh, suitcases or duffel bags full of helpful items for some of the homeless women in our community, and they will be presented with these this coming Friday night. And so we still need more help to fill some of these. If you don't have time this week to help with that, we would be happy to take a donation. If you don't have a duffel bag that you are willing to donate, you can pick one up at, back at the ministry desk after the service today. But uh, we would ask you to, to take a moment and think about filling one of these bags for some of the homeless women in our community. And it, it means an awful lot to them. Uh, also, we have our Christmas setup. If you're willing to come out tomorrow at 1 p.m., we're going to have pizza for you, a free meal, and uh, a lot of fun just to, to decorate our congregation and uh, prepare us for, for Christmas as we celebrate the, uh, the Christmas season together. So uh, mark your calendars. Come out tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Uh, get a free lunch and uh, help us decorate. That would be much appreciated. At this time, I'm so excited to announce that we have a baptism today for second service, and I'm going to invite Jackie Witsit to come forward. And Jackie, um, we have a couple of special gifts that we want to present to you. Uh, first of all, we have your baptismal certificate, so I'm going to hand you that. Now you have to Face it out for the picture. All right, there we go. Uh, and then we have a Bible for you to remember today by. So we, we want you when, you, when you pick up this Bible and read it, to remember your baptism. So I hope that you'll, you'll enjoy that as, as well. And uh, we just need to take care of an item of business. I need a motion and a second to move that subject to her baptism, that we invite Jackie to be a member of our church. I see a motion there. There's a second. All in favor, please say welcome. Welcome. All right, Jackie, we're so glad you've made this decision today and we're excited about your baptism later today. So I'll let you go prepare for that. And now I invite you to turn in your hymnals if you would like to hymn number 565. And we're going to sing together for the beauty of the earth, number 565. Let's stand as we sing. Yeah. 
this our grateful song of praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, pleasures pure and undefiled. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our grateful song of praise. For the gift of Thy dear Son, for the hope of heaven at last, for the Spirit's victory won, for the crown when life is past. Lord of all, to Thee we raise songs of gratitude and praise. I invite the congregation to kneel as we have our morning prayer. Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow before your almighty throne and we say thank you. We can only imagine what it was like to hang on a wooden cross, but we say thank you. As we witness the events around the world, wars and famines, disease and death, we can say thank you for scripture and for the estimated 3,000 promises in the Bible that give us hope and give us wisdom for our daily lives. And as each of us goes throughout our daily lives, I pray that we will take advantage of the opportunities we have to witness to our neighbors and our friends, our co-workers and strangers, so that someday they too can say thank you. And as we are in the Thanksgiving season, and we are thankful for many, many things, and we are enjoying all the festivities that come with this season. I pray that we will always remember you and keep you first and know the real reason for the season. In your precious name, amen. My disciples, my disciples, you are wrong. I am not happy with what you are doing. Let the children come unto me. For it is such as these little ones, heaven is made for them. Come, 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 come. Ah, most welcome. Ah. Meal sent. This is your day. This is your day. And we thank the Lord that you are here. By the way, Meal sent, you were born on 
was that May 10, 2013, at 11.22 p.m., just before midnight, little Millicent was ushered into this world. We praise God for that. But let him tell you, Dorothy, I wish your husband was here, but he got very busy. But you are here, Millicent, and your mother. I want you to know one thing, Millicent, and your mother, that there's a story in the Bible where Joshua was fighting the Amalekites. Aaron and Moses and Huri were on top of the mountain. Whenever the hands of Moses were up, Joshua was winning the battle. When he got tired, Joshua was losing the battle. Listen, Missant, all these people, you see them here, they are ready to help you win the battle against the devil. Amen. You cannot do this thing on your own. Joshua did not do it on his own. He was helped by other people whom he never saw. These people will be praying for you as you also continue to pray in your family. Listen to these words. Whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. Let the children Come unto me. Oh, you're looking for your mother. Okay. Okay, fine. Good. At least I brought you up. I will stand here too. The purpose of these children is because Jesus wants one day for them to wear a crown in heaven. We are not just increasing the world's population, but the heavenly population. At the end of the day, Millicent must wear a crown in heaven. Who we'll sing for you? I'll wear a crown. Then we're going to pray. I will wear a crown in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house, I will wear a crown. In my father's house, there will be joy, joy, joy. Shall we pray? Oh, it has, it, now it's more than a crown now. Okay, yeah, you, you are now in heaven, you can take it off. Shall we pray? Our loving and kind Father, who art in heaven, we are here to dedicate this baby, Millicent, the one you knew way before she was formed in her mother's womb. Father, bless the parents as they raise this child. Bless the church as Bismarck, Dorothy, fight the devil in raising their child. Just as you helped Joshua, may these be the ones holding their hands up to fight against the devil. When all is said and done, Father, we want Millicent to be found in your kingdom. We pray for her. We ask for your blessings to be upon this child. And thank you for the loving church 
and for the loving parents and for all of us. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Well, the church, the pastor, brings to you all this wonderful gift. Thank you, Pastor John. And we have a book for you, a book I wrote, Parenting for Heaven. May God bless you as you raise Millicent for God's kingdom. Thank you. Here is your crown. Boys and girls, it's time for children's story. If you could please come up. And while you are coming up, make sure you pick up the offering the adults have for you. All right, good afternoon, boys and girls. The story I'm going to tell you today is taken from this newspaper. It's called the Prince George's Journal. Can any of you guess how old this paper is? Two hundred? Two hundred. Seventy-eight? 78, 78, okay. A week? No, it's not a week. It's 31 years old. 31 years old. This was published on, uh, in 1983. Okay, the story is from here. It involves four girls. Four girls. How many of you are in kindergarten? Raise your hand. All right. Three of these girls were in kindergarten in 1983, and the other girl was in sixth grade. All right? Now, the three girls from the kindergarten that used to be in the church in the basement at that time, they were going towards the school, and they were crossing the parking lot. You know what happened? There was a speeding car coming by. It was almost about to hit those three girls, but the older girl who was the school patrol, she was quick to act. She pulled all the girls back and saved them from the car hitting. The car came to a screeching halt and everybody was okay, but there was a big, uh, after that there was a big sigh of relief. Uh, that is in the paper here. 
and it happened right, it happened right in the school parking lot. So what is the lesson we learned from this story? Never walk on the road when a car is coming. Okay, never walk on the road when the car is coming. Of course, you don't want to walk on the road anyway. Uh, but you want to know that Jesus is our patrol. He is there to keep us safe from all harm and danger. Number two we want to know, we want to learn, is that we want to be thankful. Jesus sometimes use, uses other people to help us to be safe. In this case, she used the school patrol. Okay, so we want to be thankful to our school patrol, our teachers, our parents, and our principal, and whoever else that helps us to be uh, safe and secure. So please remember that, okay? And Jesus has promised to be with us all the time. He said, I will be with you all the time. And the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. So remember that Jesus is your patrol. She is there to watch over you and keep you safe. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for each one of these children. We pray that you will keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. That was beautiful. I'm so happy today. I'm thrilled today, in fact, to be in the baptistry with my granddaughter. She's my favorite granddaughter. She knows that. Tell her that all the time. We have mentioned she's also my only granddaughter. You know. But uh, I just love Jackie to pieces. We're so honored to be here participating in uh, this baptismal service today. Uh, so uh, Jackie, Leanne Marie Whitsitt is going to be baptized today. I was born at uh, Washington Adventist Hospital. And 50 years later, my granddaughter was born at Washington Adventist Hospital. And we won't ask how old you are, because that would tell my age, so we aren't going to do that, OK? But uh, it's just really wonderful that we can be together with you. We're from Florida, and it's great to be here. You know, we want to thank you so much for what you have done for our family, uh, the Beltsville Seventh Adventist Church. We appreciate uh, so, so much love and care and attention that you have provided my son Jeff and my daughter-in-law Lisa and our, our granddaughter Jackie. We're going to ask uh, the family to come up on the platform uh, right now because they want to say a couple of words to you. And uh, as they make their way up here, I want to ask those of, of you, I, I know that um, Jackie has many friends uh, in the congregation, maybe some teachers here, former teachers, uh, Pathfinders, Adventure uh, staff, would you stand right now, wherever you are, friends of Jackie? <laughs> Thank you so much. It does take, as one has said, and it is true, it does take a village. And all of you have done so much. She has um, you know, known the Bellsville Church as her only church uh, family. And she's been in the school here since the first grade. And she's been in the Adventure Club, and she's been in the Pathfinder Club. And in fact, when she came back from Oshkosh, uh, that you sponsored, uh, she was wanting to be baptized. And so all of these things together help to make it possible. Uh, the Bible studies that are made possible by your, uh, your pastoral staff here has meant so much. Uh, the, the school, the teachers all through the years 
the Sabbath school. Just all of these things have meant so much. Well, you may be seated, and I'm going to ask the family if they'd like to say a few words right now. Jackie, you're my favorite. You've been my, my pride and my joy for my whole life. And I love you dearly. And I'm so proud of the decision that you've made today. I'm glad that our trip to Oshkosh was the turning point in the decision for you to follow Jesus. Remember to keep him always in your heart and to always let him guide and protect you for the rest of your life. I love you, princess. Amen, amen. Well, I'm very proud of you, and I, I was able to, to pray just fine, but now I'm a little emotional to your church family. But I'm proud of you, and I've, um, I've told you that every day of your life since you were born. Uh, and we're proud of your decision, and, and um, we're proud that you're our only daughter, our favorite daughter. <laughs> and we look forward to, to um, the future, the next chapter of life, and the... the uh, the progress you've made through every stage of life so far, and we're very excited and happy and proud and, and all the other metaphors and adjectives that I could ever think of. We love you very much. Amen. Amen. Jackie, my favoritest granddaughter. <laughs> Today is just such a special and very beautiful experience to participate with you in this most awesome, most important step and decision of your life that you've made. Just to share a little bit, today you are becoming the seventh generation, Seventh-day Adventist in our family. Amen. And um, Grandma, my side of the family, and, and Grandma's parents and the Cochran side of the family, the very first Seventh-day Adventists in my side of the family lived in Yuma County, Eastern Colorado, in a sod house. Mm -hmm. And their baptism was out in the pasture of the cattle ranch in the cattle's drink barrel. <laughs> it's too dry, there's no rivers, no streams, and there was no church with the baptistry. Their decision was solid, they were firm in the Lord, they lived their life to God's glory, they passed the tor torch from generation to generation, and today, Sweetheart, you are generation number seven. Yes, it's the perfect number. That's right. That's right. Family worship. Family playtime. Modeling the Seventh-day Adventist Christian lifestyle is what it's all about in passing this torch. Today, our sweet Jackie, we are very proud and honored to participate in presenting you to the Lord in baptism. From the first moment that Granddad and I laid eyes on you when you were born, we have prayed every single day that as you grew and learned, you would first want to follow Jesus, and this day would come and we are just so thrilled and want to wish you God's richest blessings in all your days ahead. Amen. Amen. Jackie, you are Grandma and Grandpa's most beautiful blue-eyed granddaughter. Because <laughs> that's the only one we have that's got blue eyes. We wish that Grandpa could have been here today, honey. 
We'll take pictures and we'll show him, okay? As you celebrate this most important day of your whole life. You told me that this morning. That was exciting to hear you say that. We remember waiting for the day and the phone call that you were born. And now today, honey, you're going to be born again into the life of following Jesus more closely. He has wonderful plans for you, honey. And as you say yes to those plans, you'll be happy, just like you are now. And soon we'll all go to heaven together, forever. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Jackie, because you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart and you have chosen him to be your savior for the remission of sins and to guide you, empower you in his presence each day of your life, in your decision making, your plans, and in everything that you choose, we know that Jesus will be, as he promises, there every step of the way. And that's pretty wonderful. That takes all the worry out, takes all the frustration to realize that Jesus is your guide. He'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, no matter what, because he loves you with an everlasting love. So it's my privilege as a minister of the gospel to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time together. I'm so grateful, Lord, for this decision that Jackie has made. So thankful for her parents and her grandparents and all that have had so much to do in the family here, the church family. Lord, we want to praise you for guiding each one to help Jackie make this decision and the promises that you give her today to never leave her or forsake her. If there are any here in the congregation that, that haven't taken this step yet, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct to make this all-important decision. Thank you, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great and precious are the promises of God. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. God's promises are precious. God's promises are great. God's promises are limitless. Let us claim God's promises with joy and peace as we give today. And as we give, we participate in the life of God and the work of the gospel. Let's bow our heads. Merciful Father in heaven, this season of thanksgiving has helped us to reflect on your promises. We realize, Lord, that your promises are great, limitless. And as we participate now in this worshipful uh, action of giving, we ask their Father that you will touch us, that you will continue to make us into the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, church family. I'm very grateful to our almighty God who has provided me an opportunity to join my new family at Bellsville Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Will asked me to share my story with you today, and so I agreed. You see, I was baptized at age seven, I'm sorry, at age 12 in New Well, I'll tell you what. A baby dedication, a baptism, a profession of faith. It doesn't get any better than this for me as a pastor. <laughs> it's been an amazing day already. And uh, I praise the Lord for the excitement of the decisions that are being made today. You know, that brings me to my sermon topic, the good life. You see, we all have to decide what it is that defines the good life for us? It's a question that we, we all have to answer because it seems to be deeply ingrained within us to seek out the good life, to, to try to be well off, however we define that for ourselves. And there's many ways that we attempt to define this. And you see it through the decisions that people make. But I decided to try to, to find some images that I thought maybe would, would capture at least a little bit of how certain people might define this idea of the good life. Um, whoa, all right, I've got to go. All right, there we go, back to the beginning there. So this, here's one that, that stood out to me. So here's a guy that seems to be, maybe he's at work, I'm not sure, surrounded by smiling friends. and and. This kind of captured a little bit of what the essence of the good life might be, that uh, success, I mean, he seems to be good at what he does, people like him, 
And, and, and that captures some of the elements of the good life. And the same with this picture here. Someone, here's a woman enjoying a company of friends and um, just that idea of community and being with people you love and, and succeeding. Um, this one is to capture beauty. If I look good, that's the good life. And, uh, and that's something that's, that's also in our minds, I think. Um, material possessions. Anybody want to drive this car? <laughs> I know I would. Um, that's the good life. If I, if I have enough money to, to be able to drive a car that's that nice, maybe that's the good life. And that's something that I would enjoy. And then finally here, if I have children in my life, a beautiful family, a nice house, a beautiful yard, that's the good life. I'm enjoying material success and the love of family and friends. What is it that makes the good life for you? I would say that most people in our country believe that health, wealth, success are the main components of the good life. Some focus more on avoiding pain and discomfort in their quest for the good life. Some focus on making lots of money, buying lots of things. Think about Black Friday just yesterday. But how about you? Are you living what you would describe as the good life? Do you consider yourself to be well off? Or is it possible to be living a great life and yet feeling miserable most of the time? So much depends on what you focus on. And Paul writes about this, the powerful path to the good life, in the letter, his letter to the Philippians. And we're going to look at that in chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. And I've got it up here on the screen for you if, you, if you'd like. Philippians 4, 4 through 8, Paul says this. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. How much, how often should we rejoice? Some of the time? Always. Rejoice always. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make you, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul is giving us a powerful hint here about what it means to live the good life. He says, if your mind is focused on all the good things that you have been given, then you will most certainly feel gratitude and positive feelings about your life. Even when from the outside, other people looking at your life may not be all that impressed you can have joy on the inside because you're focused on the good that God is doing in your life. However, even if your life looks like some of those images I put up earlier, it looks perfect on the outside. If your mind is focused on what you don't have, on what is going wrong in your life, you can look perfect on the outside and be miserable and empty on the inside. And Paul says the difference is based on where you focus your mind. If you focus on what is good, true, noble, and right, that makes all the difference. But when we focus on what is wrong in our lives, then we are more likely to be resentful, angry, depressed, despairing. And no matter how many blessings God keeps sending our way, we look at the one little thing that we don't like. 
and we choose to be miserable based on that. You see, no matter how many blessings we have, we cannot enjoy them if we don't take the time to be grateful for them. No matter how many blessings come our way, if we're focused on problems, those blessings will be taken for granted. But there's a deeper issue, and this is the harder point when it comes to gratitude and the good life. And that is, but what about pain and suffering? What about when things don't go my way? What about difficulties in life? Is Paul asking us to cover up our pain with a fake smile? Is that what Paul is asking here? I don't believe he is. Is Paul asking for us to be thankful for some of the terrible things that happen in the world, for injustice, for violence, for physical disease, for broken relationships, for lost jobs? Is he asking us to be thankful for these, these terrible things in the world? I don't think he is. But how can we be thankful when bad things are happening all the time? What Paul is saying is both simple and deeply profound. He is telling us to focus our minds on what is good, even in the midst of sadness and pain. And it's kind of like this. I think sometimes when it comes to, to pain and joy, we have it in our minds that it's, it's, it's either one or the other. I'm either really happy or I'm suffering, and it, it's, it's, I'm either one or the other. But Paul is saying that it's possible to experience both and. In other words, if we're going through a hard time, it doesn't mean we deny the pain. It doesn't mean we act like it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean we try to escape it. We still feel the pain in our lives, and yet, in the midst of pain, we don't let the pain dominate everything that we see in our lives. It's a peace. But our eyes are focused on Jesus and on the good that He has given us. And with our eyes focused on that, in the midst of pain, we can also feel enormous gratitude and joy even while this is going on. And so it's this mixture of joy for the good that our eyes are focused on with sorrow for, the, for the, the pain that's in the world that might be may not even be our pain, it may be someone else's. But that's there too. But the joy is what we're focused on. The joy is where our thoughts go. And this is a powerful thing that God gives to us. You see, the truth is, and this is hard to accept sometimes, the truth is, you are already living the good life. You just may not be grateful for it yet. You're already living the good life. You just may not be grateful for it yet. About two and a half years ago, I had a decision that I needed to make, a very difficult decision, because I knew it would affect the next three years of my life. Um, I had concluded all of my classes for my Doctor of Ministry degree, and I had to de decide what topic did I want to focus on for the next three years and just dive into it and, and, and learn everything I could about this one topic. Well, I knew that I was interested in spiritual growth, how, the, how we can grow spiritually and, and become more like Jesus in our lives and, 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 and live more like Him. But that topic is way too broad for a doctor of ministry project, so I had to narrow it down. And I'm so grateful that I had an advisor who steered me toward the subject of gratitude. And so two and a half years ago, I made the decision, I'm going to study gratitude. And I have immersed myself in that topic for the last two and a half years, reading almost everything that's out there on the subject of gratitude. And, and it's been a, a great study. I've, I've actually really, really enjoyed it. And, and there's so much that I've learned, and I, I, will, I will only give you a small piece today because there's, there's not time. But the first thing that I did was I sat down and I read every passage of Scripture 
that referenced either praise, thanksgiving, or gratitude. And there are 451, to be exact, of these passages. <laughs> so that took a long time. And um, so that's the first thing that hit me, is that gratitude is a major theme of Scripture. It's, it's everywhere we look in the Bible. There's something about being thankful, about giving praise, something there. And intellectually, after reading these texts and even before reading them, I said to myself, I am all in favor of gratitude. I want to be a more grateful person. But I also had to admit that I really wasn't a very grateful person. Like, I, I really, I just tended to focus on problems and what was wrong. And, and much to my relief, as I got into the research, I discovered that I wasn't alone in this. Um, that actually the human brain, by itself, naturally defaults to looking at problems. Did you know that? That your brain, if you, if you do not intentionally focus on something, will default to focusing on problems, on the faults of others, or on your own faults. It naturally, your brain naturally is hardwired to go to the negative. Unless you intentionally choose to focus on the positive. So that's, that's why gratitude is, can be difficult. And it's not your fault. You're not a bad person if you struggle with it. It just means you're a human being, and that's what your brain naturally does. And that's why I believe Paul challenges us in Philippians 4 to focus on the true, the noble, the right, the pure, the lovely, the admirable, the excellent, and the praiseworthy. He says when we fix our minds on what is good, it can change the way that we think about our lives. In fact, the two leading researchers on the subject of gratitude, Robert Emons and Michael McAuliffe, they said this as a conclusion to, to many of their studies. They said, gratitude not only makes people feel good in the present, but it increases the likelihood that people will function optimally and feel good in the future. So gratitude has the power to change the way you see your life now, and it's going to help you make better decisions in the future. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? And something so simple as a practice of looking at what is good in your life can radically change the way you feel about your entire life. Because the truth is, you are living the good life. You just may not be grateful for it yet. You're living the good life right now. However, I need to give a word of warning. And we won't turn to all the scriptures that refer to this. But the Bible warns us about ingratitude. Because ingratitude has the power to reverse all of the positive effects of gratitude. Ingratitude is choosing to focus our minds on what we don't like, on what we don't have. And when we do that, it can wipe out all of the goodness that we're feeling. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say you're having a great day. You're filled with thanksgiving, overflowing with joy. And as you're driving along, somebody pulls out in front of you that's going 10 miles an hour but below the speed limit. Now that happened to me, I think it was last Sabbath, coming to church. Someone pulled out, and they were going 25 miles an hour. I felt like I could walk faster than they were driving. Um, and you, there's a part of you that thinks, great, now I'm going to be late. And if you focus on that inconvenience, as small as it is, it's amazing how powerful it can become to wipe out the joy in your life. Something, something that's so ridiculous as a slow driver, can fix our minds, some small little thing that has nothing to do with the, the larger picture of our lives, can wipe out the joy. And so I have to ask the question, do a few little bad things really have the power to wipe out everything that's good in your life? They can if we fixate on it. If that's all I look at, it can. It can be that powerful. But I also have the choice to set that aside and to focus on the bigger picture. 
on the goodness of God, on the fact that I'm alive, that I, that I have people that, that love me in my life, that I, that I have health, that I live in, in an amazing country that is full of wealth and opportunity. If I just focus on a few of these things, it can center me back on the goodness of God and what He is doing in my life. You see, the truth is this. We are all living the good life. We just may not be grateful for it yet. And when we learn how to become more grateful, even in the midst of of pain and, and challenges, as we learn how to do that, it can radically change the way we feel about our lives. In fact, the research says that your level of gratitude is directly correlated with your level of life satisfaction. So if you want to feel good about your life, gratitude is an essential practice in order to do so. Well, I I asked Gloria as she was sharing her testimony to leave you hanging. If you notice, she left you at a a, a kind of a a challenging spot, like what testimony ends with, and then I drifted away. (laughs) Um, So I, I, I asked her to leave you hanging so that she could come finish her testimony here at the end of my message today because her testimony really speaks to this idea of is it possible to be grateful even in the midst of challenges and difficult times? And so, Gloria, I'm going to invite you up to go ahead and and finish the rest of your story, and then we'll, we'll conclude today. Thank you again. I promise it won't take that long. Okay. In the summer of 2012, I started getting the same feelings of emptiness and feelings of void in my life. I would always pass this church and thought about coming in, but I kept on going. Finally, one summer day, I found myself being brave and stepped into this church. I was sitting by myself when I felt someone touch my shoulder lightly. I turned and saw a warm, smiling face, Lucy Sloan. She welcomed me, and I said to myself, wow, maybe God does want me to come here. Rest is history. I kept coming to church and met pastors Donna and Glenn Holland. To me, they were the true picture of what God must be like. They were so humble, kind, nurturing, and most of all, non-judgmental. I was not used to this kind of treatment. I noticed from not being in church for the past 20 years that actually the culture had changed. I found people here were different. They were down to earth and approachable. Everyone here appeared to be real. Tragedy struck me again second time on July 9, 2013. My husband suffered massive heart attacks, three total, and he died on August 4, 2013. My world was turned upside down again, and I was in shock. However, this time around, I realized I was not alone. You see, my relationship with Jesus was very real, personable by this time. He was already preparing me for this major crisis that I was to face in full force. However, I felt his presence in my life, and I knew he is in control, and he will not leave me. Matter of fact, he never left me all these years. It was me. It was I who let go of his hands. He is truly a loving, kind, and forgiving God. I am so proud to shout and tell everyone, oh, how I love Jesus. I thank him every day and will continue to. Despite the devastating tragedies in my life, I am not bitter nor angry with God. I have learned to accept his will and whatever comes my way. 
Like the song, I don't know about tomorrow, the chorus goes this way. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Though I may not know what might happen tomorrow, one thing I know for sure, he holds my hand and will always, and, and always will. I love Jesus very much. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Gloria. I really appreciate the sharing. Thank you. It's beautiful. What a powerful testimony of, of God's working in your life, Gloria. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what we see is it doesn't mean when we, when we practice gratitude that, that everything goes perfect in our lives. It doesn't mean that the pain just evaporates and goes away. But it gives us a way to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and the good that He is giving us in our lives. And through that, it keeps us going. And we are, we are empowered to face whatever that may come in our lives. I'd like to give you an opportunity at this time to take this connection card that's in your bulletin. And uh, if you are interested in learning more about gratitude and, and how, you, um, how you can become a more grateful person, um, I have spent the last two and a half years researching how to help people do that. I still don't know if it's going to work yet or not, but uh, at least <laughs> I've got a plan that it's a class that you could take starting on January 7, at 7 p.m. It's during the prayer meeting time, and the prayer meeting group has graciously uh, agreed to go through this class with me. We'll meet uh, for four weeks straight, and then every other week after that for the next eight weeks. So four weeks in a row, and then every other week for, for eight weeks on Wednesday nights. And this is an opportunity that you have to learn more about the subject of gratitude. And if, if you're interested in this, if you want more information about it, please take a moment to fill out this card. And uh, you see you have some choices there uh, that you can check. But we'd love to have you as part of the class. I talked to the prayer meeting group and they said, the more the merrier. So we, we, can, uh, we can have a big class together and, and just enjoy that time learning more about how to be a more grateful person. And, and I could just only share this is that as I've learned more about this subject, um, it has made me a much more grateful person. And, and it's, it's really made my life so much better. And, and I, I'm so incredibly grateful for that, uh, for that opportunity. Um, and it, it's just been an amazing journey and experience. So I invite you to consider um, taking some proactive steps, even if you don't join the class, to say, how, it, how can I focus my mind more on what I have? Because the bottom line is that you are living the good life. You just may not be grateful for it yet. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us so many gifts. And we thank you that on Thursday this past week, we had an opportunity to reflect on all of those gifts. The abundance of food you have blessed us with, the, the, the comfortable shelter that we enjoy every day, the warmth of family and friends and a church family, and of course, the gift of Jesus and your love for us and the good news of heaven and your soon coming. All of these things are gifts that we can sometimes take for granted when our minds focus elsewhere. But I pray today that you will keep our minds fixed on what is good, that you will help us learn how to become more grateful in living our lives day to day. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, happy Sabbath church. Are there any visitors with us today? If so, could you please stand? Thank you, thank you. Welcome to our church family. We're glad that you could come. We're honored to share this day with you as we worship God's risen son. We hope that God will touch your life as we worship side by side and that as you leave this place today, God's peace will be inside. We ask that each of you will please stand and greet each other with a wonderful, welcoming Beltsville. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. While you're returning to your seats, we have just a couple of announcements that we want to draw your attention to. Uh, one of them has a slide that we can put up on the screen. While we're getting that, I want to call your attention to these. Yeah, we prepare every year uh, suitcases or duffel bags full of helpful items for some of the homeless women in our community, and they will be presented with these this coming Friday night. And so we still need more help to fill some of these. If you don't have time this week to help with that, we would be happy to take a donation. If you don't have a duffel bag that you are willing to donate, you can pick one up at, back at the ministry desk after the service today. But uh, we would ask you to, to take a moment and think about filling one of these bags for some of the homeless women in our community. And it, it means an awful lot to them. Uh, also, we have our Christmas setup. If you're willing to come out tomorrow at 1 p.m., we're going to have pizza for you, a free meal, and uh, a lot of fun just to, to decorate our congregation and uh, prepare us for, for Christmas as we celebrate the, uh, the Christmas season together. So uh, mark your calendars. Come out tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Uh, get a free lunch and uh, help us decorate. That would be much appreciated. At this time, I'm so excited to announce that we have a baptism today for second service, and I'm going to invite Jackie Witsit to come forward. And Jackie, um, we have a couple of special gifts that we want to present to you. Uh, first of all, we have your baptismal certificate, so I'm going to hand you that. Now you have to face it out for the picture. All right, there we go. Uh, and then we have a Bible for you to remember today by. So we, we want you when, you, when you pick up this Bible and read it, to remember your baptism. So I hope that you'll, you'll enjoy that as, as well. And uh, we just need to take care of an item of business. I need a motion and a second to move that subject to her baptism, that we invite Jackie to be a member of our church. I see a motion there. There's a second. All in favor, please say welcome. Welcome. All right, Jackie, we're so glad you've made this decision today and we're excited about your baptism later today. So I'll let you go prepare for that. And now I invite you to turn in your hymnals if you would like to hymn number 565. And we're going to sing together for the beauty of the earth, number 565. Let's stand as we sing. Over and 
and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our grateful song of praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, Friends on earth and friends above, pleasures pure and undefiled. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our grateful song of praise. For the gift of thy dear Son, for the hope of heaven at last, for the Spirit's victory won, for the crown when life is past. Lord of all, to thee we raise songs of gratitude and praise. I invite the congregation to kneel as we have our morning prayer. Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow before your almighty throne and we say thank you. We can only imagine what it was like to hang on a wooden cross, but we say thank you. As we witness the events around the world, wars and famines, disease and death, we can say thank you for scripture and for the estimated 3,000 promises in the Bible that give us hope and give us wisdom for our daily lives. And as each of us goes throughout our daily lives, I pray that we will take advantage of the opportunities we have to witness to our neighbors and our friends, our co-workers and strangers, so that someday they too can say thank you. And as we are in the Thanksgiving season, and we are thankful for many, many things, and we are enjoying all the festivities that come with this season, I pray that we will always remember you and keep you first, and know the real reason for the season. In your precious name, amen. <laughs> 